If I asked you, what do you think of when a bunch of grandmasters are going to play a classical chess tournament? Probably a lot of draws. One of the main reasons we like Rapid and Blitz so much is the fact that there's going to be a lot more decisive games. In day two of the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz, two thirds of the games were decisive. After the first day, Levon Aronian and Pantala Harikrishna were in first place. Let's see what happened in the second day. We kick things off with Magnus Carlsen, and there's a reason he is on the thumbnail. Today, he actually took on both Hare Krishna and Levon Aronian. First Levon in the fourth game, uh, and in round six, he played against Hare Krishna. So we get a Grunfeld. d4, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, d5, an opening that I didn't actually think that Levon played. We get knight f3 and queen b3. This is called the Russian system. Uh, already a terrifying name. The point is to put more pressure on the center, and you're okay getting your queen out because you take the entire center. All of this is mainline theory, but here, knight d7 is the move that's played 90% of the time, and Levon plays a move that doesn't get played very often, about 30 or 40 games total, knight g4, which is either really good or really bad, because it means that you've either prepared a surprise, or you're trying to trick your opponent, and they're going to know what they're doing, and it's only going to go poorly. So we get h3, kicking the knight this way, Bishop d3, and now Levon had to play the theoretical move bishop b7, instead he played this attacking the queen, and just got overrun down the middle of the board. These moves look weird, because knight d7, the whole point is that if you take the bishop, I'm going to play knight c5 and I fork you, and so we get bishop b1, and Magnus just basically trades the pieces and dominates in the center of the board. At a certain point, he crashes through, and the rest of the game is more about cleanup than anything else, he's up a pawn, and Levon has a very damaged position. Uh, he tries to coordinate his pieces, kind of like, <laughs> like this. All the pieces begin coming back and trying to hug each other, and Magnus just chips away. Finds a little infiltration there with the queen, uh, and is able to use his pawns, his knight, rotate, and actually the entire thumbnail is right here, as Magnus is up a full knight in this position and gives a check to the Black King, forcing a trade. You would take back here, and Magnus would very comfortably win this endgame up a knight. So Levon resigned because he didn't want to challenge Magnus in a peace odds position. Also in the first round, uh, as part of five decisive games in the first round, by the way, five decisive games, every game had a result that was not a draw, Hare Krishna was playing against Nepo. This one started out with a queen takes d4 Sicilian, so e4, c5, and normally here you play knight takes, queen d4 though, uh, and this kind of new modern twist where white plays the queen back to e3, stops knight g4, with the pawn h3 move, and then develops. But Nepo strikes in the center very quickly, knight takes d5, queen b3, knight b6, moves his queen out of danger. And Nepo is like a beast at these imbalanced positions, so he sets up two bishops like this in an orthodox fashion, hitting these diagonals. Uh, knight, uh, sorry, not knight, but bishop d5, centralizing, putting the, the pawn up to e6, making this trade, and then putting that knight to d5 to replace. C4 was played by uh, Hare Krishna, looking to get this knight out of here. It was a very complicated middle game fight, but uh, Nepo got the upper hand right around here. First, he brought his queen out to now take part in the attack. Then he played e4, very important move, attacking the knight, opening up this bishop. We've got knight d2, and knight jumps into d3. You've got a take because there was a fork of the rooks. Now the queen is protecting, and this is a very pleasant position. Now we have the new knight coming in. The other knight did its job trade, but the problem is that the rook covers the pawn, and you'll see as Nepo really just for the rest of the game focuses all of his moves on the d2 and d1 push, rotating his bishop all the way back, and finally finding a way here to rotate the rook, crash through on c1, and a nice little move there to finish the game, pinning the knight to the queen with the bishop, and the game is simply over. Nepo beats Hare Krishna, and Levon falls as well, so the guys leading the tournament fall. First game, uh, we also saw Jeffrey Shong versus Grishuk, which wasn't a very interesting opening. It was a Sicilian defense with bishop b5 check. Uh, this is called the Moscow variation. And it was a weird opening. I mean, I'm not going to get into too much of the meta or the theory here, but I will basically fast forward to this position. If we take a look, the structure is identical. Both sides have exactly six pawns, uh, and they have more or less equivalent pieces, just bishop for knight discrepancy. So the position is pretty balanced, but it's difficult for white to create a plan, and black is very active. Black kind of controls the only open lines. So here Jeffrey plays with his pieces. He creates this little pawn march in the center, but all of a sudden rook c8, and you see the problem. The rook and the queen both hit this guy, and if this guy moves, you take this. So Grishuk takes, 
sacrificing the rook, getting two pieces. And here, Jeffrey should be able to stabilize because the pawn structure, again, is the same. And even though black has two pieces for the rook, it's going to be more or less very difficult to win this. It's going to take a very long time. And it was taking a very long time. Pieces were getting traded. Grishuk won another pawn, but Jeffrey was trying to be very solid. Jeffrey was trying to be very solid. Trading a pawn here, trading some more pawns, and just moving around, and moving around, and then hanging a rook. That's how Jeffrey lost this game. He went up until move 59, and then disaster struck. I don't know if he mouse lit. Maybe he meant to play king f2. I, mean, I have no idea. He just literally played king f3, and he got forked, and that was the end of the game. So a point for Alexander Grishuk, a relatively lackluster game, just basically one blunder. Big other game from the first round was Hikaru versus Ferruja, and a repeat opening that we saw yesterday between Hikaru and Magnus Carlsen. Ferruja goes for the same thing. I don't know if he was inspired. I don't know if he had deep preparation. But where he goes a little bit differently here uh, is here. Uh, he doesn't actually play the move e6, and this is White's entire idea. White plays e6 himself. Obviously, if you take, I'm going to go queen g6, so takes. Now we throw in the in-between move, that's called capturing with a check. And we have this structure. And white is a little bit better here because white is able to jump the knight out and potentially create some problems. Although white does have a bad structure, white has open lines as a result of that structure on the e-file and potentially the c-file. And Ali Reza did not play very well. Uh, Hikaru played a bunch of very natural moves. Bishop g5, knight f3, rook e1, a3 to cut the knight from coming to b4. And then here he played a nice idea, routing this knight to g3 to trade off f5 knight because it's the protector of the e7 pawn. So very nice idea. That's called a reroute when you route a piece backwards or to the other side of the board. There's just no way to protect this. If you take, I go here and it's devastation. And then I'll take or I'll just destroy your king. So we got bishop back to f8 and Hikaru simplified the position into an end game where he is up a couple of pawns like this. Actually just one pawn, but he will win the b7 pawn because it's a little bit too passive for Ferruja to play a move like rook b8. And these three pawns, connected past pawns, proved to be decisive. I will slowly shuffle through to show you how he did it. Ali Reza tried to invest in the d-pawn, but Hikaru very solidly made sure that he controlled the d-file, trading. And at a key moment, you will see the very instructive thing that he did. He sacrifices the rook for the pawn and plays g5. And Ali Reza resigned because even though you have a rook, the connected past pawns when they are far enough, are unstoppable. So for example, if Ali Reza plays rook g6, I just play f4, and they all guard each other. If you go after my pawn, I don't need to protect it. I mean, I can, but I think king h7 is winning all the same. Uh, sorry, not king h7, but pawn h7 uh, is just a winning position. If Ali Reza goes all the way back, you can't really stop me. I mean, my pawns are just too far. Rook g8, g7, h7, and I'm going to win. So a very nice win from Hikaru out the gate. And the last game of the round was a beautiful attack. I'll actually send it to around move 13, where Wesley So voluntarily damaged his structure uh, against Lenier Dominguez to do exactly this. Play knight d4, and then sacrifice this d-pawn. Watch what he does. c5, takes, takes, and queen d3. The point is, if you take me with the rook, I have this gorgeous move, knight f6. Check. If you take... I don't take, my queen is hanging. I check you, your only move is king to h8, pawn takes f6, threatening your queen, and threatening mate. Black would have to sacrifice the queen, and white would go on to win this position. It would take some time, but white would be winning. And so for that reason, you take with a pawn, but now I use this pawn as my own barrier. I hide behind your pawn, and I create a giant attack. And that's exactly what Wesley spent the game doing. He plays rook f5, gives the rook again, because knight f6, king h8, and queen f5 would lead to mate. Beautiful from Wesley. And then forces Lanier to push his pawns forward. This rook is still hanging because this is going to be discovered check and mate. And finally, knight takes f7 and Lanier's position collapses as Wesley shatters the position and wins with the two remaining pieces, queen and pawn. He's too fast. If d2, you have check, check, you pick up the rook and you pick up the pawn and it cannot become a queen. And it was in this position that Ligné Dominguez resigned because of the gorgeous triple threat. I mean, that is an absolutely destructive game from Wesley So in the first round. He is playing incredible chess. In the second round, actually, yeah, I will focus on this game. Magnus Carlsen was playing against Ligné Dominguez. And in this position, you have a chance. I'll let you try to guess what Magnus Carlsen played. 
It's not what you think, and actually, I, I respect it. Magnus Carlsen plays something that I don't think I've, like, ever seen him play. I don't... Guys, tell me when the last time Magnus Carlsen played the Philidor defense with d6 on move 2. The Philidor is a little bit worse for black. You're very passive, but it's a great opening to play against the guy like Linier Dominguez, because Linier Dominguez is super well-prepared, and he's a very solid player. And this game, Magnus did anything but be solid. He made Linier castle queenside, so it's already going to be a very spicy game. Both players began mobilizing on each other with the pawns, and the game got super spicy very quickly. In positions like this, computers give crazy evaluations. They'll say plus 1.5 because, you know, they see the power of their attack, but they might not envision the power of the enemy attack. Computer evaluation aside, this game was incredibly spicy, and probably the most advanced moment is right here. When Magnus Carlsen takes one step forward, sorry, one step backward to go two steps forward, he plays knight d7, the idea being to put the bishop on f6, fight on this diagonal, and defend his own pawn. And that is exactly what he did. Closed the center, put the knight on c5, and just destroyed Linier's king safety. He slipped up a little bit here. Uh, those of you who are probably watching the live broadcast know that Magnus missed the, missed the win somewhere in here. Like maybe rook b4 wasn't the most accurate move. I think uh, Magnus should have played with his queen, but it doesn't matter. Both players were very low on time, and I don't want to criticize anybody getting into time pressure. Magnus sacrificed the rook to maintain this bishop on the board, and that bishop was incredibly important. Even though Linier Dominguez was doing okay here, here he blundered. He went for queen e4, and uh, this is why you should always look for checks. You guys sometimes don't like when I flip the board quickly, so I will pause here just for a second. You now have the black position here. How does black win? Black to play and win. You can pause it, give you a few seconds, take a drink of water. Rook takes b2. And the rook cannot stay guarding the queen. So king b2, d3, gorgeous discover check. Now we see the real value of this bishop. And you just give checks down here, and it's over. Rook f2, queen f2 is mate. And if king f1, you take the rook, and then you take everything else. Just absolutely destructive game in Magnus Carlsen 2-0 and on the day. The other weird game, uh, decisive game of the day in round two, round five overall, was Zhang Nepo. At this point, Jeffrey Zhang was, I think, tied for last. Nepo had just won a brilliant game. Jeffrey Zhang surprised Nepo with the Alakine. And boy, did he surprise Nepo with the Alakine. Because watch what Nepo does. He threatens mate, rotates his queen to b3 to hit the b7 pawn, takes the b7 pawn, and then... I... I, I Look, I'm not going to say much. I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. I don't know what this is. This is a delayed bong cloud. This, but like I said on the live broadcast, bong cloud is supposed to give you a, you know, relaxation and peace and you're supposed to feel good. I, I, I sure as hell don't feel good here. And Jeffrey just gave him the peace here and then hunted down his king. He didn't even take the rook. He went back and took the bishop instead to just be up, just no, sorry, not up down a pawn, but you can't castle. You just can't castle. Uh, and, and it's just over. I mean, here's probably the most gangster move of the game. Bishop h6, queen d5. And if you take me, I just go in here. And I mean, it's just destruction. I just... I mean, the king literally... This is no castling chess for one guy. And yes, castling chess for the other guy. Uh, in the game, we got rook b2 and resignation from Jan. I don't know what this game was. I, I really don't know. But Jeffrey gets the, the points and Jan goes down. I, that's it. That's the whole story. That was the only other decisive game of the second round. The third round, we're going to start with Magnus again uh, against Hare Krishna. Pintala has been having a pretty solid tournament. He's been playing a lot of Karo Khans. And actually, I will be making a video on the Karo Khan games from this tournament because there have been a ton of them. We got uh, a short variation. Interesting line. Not a very popular variation, but Magnus just building up a solid center. Pintala breaking. Thematic move here. F6 in the Karo Khan. Uh, and getting a nice and solid position. But here, I'll give you the moment. Pintala played a move that he, he didn't really have to play. Uh, he played the move knight c5. You'll notice that this is defended by the queen, and now this bishop is hit and this bishop is hit. But Magnus Carlsen just disregards all of that and plays the move rook f1, attacking the queen. And so here you can sacrifice your queen and win one of my bishops. And the million dollar question is, which one of my bishops do you want to win? Do you want my dark square bishop? Or do you want my light square bishop? And in the game, Pantala Hare Krishna chose incorrectly. 
He actually took the dark squared bishop, and apparently he had to take the light squared bishop. Let's see why. He takes, and Magnus is able to utilize the bishop, I guess, to chip away at the weaknesses. I guess it's because there are so many remaining weaknesses on the light squares that Magnus is able to do some serious damage to the light squared pawn in the center. That's why the dark squared bishop had to stay on the board. And actually, oh, bishop takes d5 is a brutal way to end it. King g7 runs into what exactly? Maybe Hari just resigned because even though he's not lost right away, it's just a very unpleasant position. I can imagine that Hari was just disgusted with himself. The point is that if rook takes d5, you have this. Uh, and there's the loss of more material. So Hare Krishna resigned. And Magnus wins three out of three. No wonder he's on the thumbnail flipping over his competitors. The other big game uh, of the round was uh, Hikaru versus Jan. We thought that this would be a spicy matchup. And it began with an offbeat Sicilian with a4 and h3 and so on. And it had a chance very early to be a, an immortal game from Hikaru. And it had a chance to be an immortal game, I'll tell you why. This is all just peace shuffling, different ideas. It happened, it started happening right around here. Ikaru built up a big pawn center, and he went after Jan. And he went after Jan. And he really went after Jan. So he sacrifices three pawns. Like, do the math on that. Ikaru is down three pawns in this position, but the position is apparently 0-0-0. Zero, zero, zero. There's apparently an idea here for white, different idea, uh, different ideas that, that, that are interesting, like people were yelling at me during the broadcast, Queen F2, you know, because people looking at the engine and what it's saying, with the idea to hit the bishop and the pawn, and if bishop F6 here, hitting the rook, and this, and it's hitting this, because you can't take. So there were a lot of very interesting attacking ideas. However, in the game we got Queen H6, which doesn't quite threaten this, because the queen is guarding, but this is a very nice idea from Nepo, and if you take, now I come back and I protect. So we had Queen, we had Hikaru play the move, Knight d4, which is a rid ridiculous move. The point is that if Bishop takes, you sacrifice, you take on g6, and you, have a, you just deliver a checkmating attack to the king by bringing your rook out later, which is just crazy. But instead we got Queen e4, which x-rays the pieces, defends the pawn, and Nepo sacrificed the queen and transformed the endgame into this, where he has two rooks and three pawns uh, for the queen. And then he traded off the bishop for the knight and defended very well. Hikaru was fighting for a draw. Well, I should say defended very well. He played it very well. Uh, it, more like he defended his weaknesses very well. Because he does have a few things that could be a little bit delicate. And we know that a queen can be tricky. Maybe not for Nepo, but for the average viewer, obviously. And Nepo just plays in beautiful fashion. Great piece coordination, and it turns out that winning this pawn hurts white more than it benefits him because the king becomes too weak, and as all the pawns begin to clear off the board, we notice something. Uh, Hikaru's king got stuck in a mating net. Here, Nepo played rook f5 check, and it's quite literally ladder mate on the board. King g2 and checkmate. Very, very nice win from Nepo. A weird day for Nepo because he won two nice games and just threw away that middle game to Jeffrey Shang, like in totally stunning fashion. Hikaru going down in the final round. But one more thing before you go. There was another decisive result in the final round. And by the way, it was a Karo Khan. But skip that. We had a super interesting position around move 20. It was Linier Dominguez, Ali Reza Faruja. We had G3, Knight F3. Ali Reza hunting down Linier's king. Queen C6. An offer of a repetition from Linier. Ali Reza plays the move knight to g5 here, declining the repetition. Rook h4, and Ali Reza lost on time. He was in a deep time trouble, 10 seconds, 5 seconds, etc. to make a move. And he didn't play a move in time. It wasn't a disconnect. He just got lost in his thoughts here and, was, and, and lost the game on time. It's a very complicated position. It is 0, 0, 0 when you plug it into the computer, which just means unclear. It doesn't mean equal. It just means... Terribly complicated. So a heartbreaking way for Ali Reza to end the day. And what's crazy about it is that had Linier lost this game, he would have went 0-3 today. He would have been winless with three losses. So that's a, that's a huge turnaround, a huge two points. Uh, and day two of the Rapid and Blitz ends with the following scoreline. Magnus Carlsen, nine points. Nepo and so with eight. Aronian, Hari, and Grishuk, 7-6-5. And Hikaru tied there with Grishuk. Uh, with with uh, five points at seventh, Jeffrey, Dominguez, and Feruja. 
Crazy, crazy heartbreak there at the end for Ferrugia. We feel for him. We will continue the coverage tomorrow. The rapid portion will conclude. And remember that this is a rapid and blitz event as always. So all the points will be tallied at the end. We will not find out a winner until uh, September 19th. Guys, check out over there. If you made it this far, hit the subscribe button. Give the video a thumbs up. Write something nice to someone in the comments or your own. And I'll see you in the recap tomorrow.